Turning points change the course of our lives. Whether it's a big decision, overcoming an obstacle or tragedy, or taking a leap of faith, these stories of inspiration and resilience are what Turning Point is all about. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Turning Point. I'm your host, Priya Sam, and this week I have Paralympian Keely Shaw as my guest. Keely recently won a bronze medal in paracycling at the Tokyo Paralympics. She was also the first Canadian to win a medal at these games. Before she set her sights on the Paralympic podium, Keeley was a talented hockey player with Olympic aspirations. A tragic turning point changed everything for her, and we are going to hear more about that today as well. Keeley is joining us from Saskatoon. Thank you so much for being here, Keeley, and welcome to Turning Point. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be able to chat today with a little bit of my story. Yeah, you know, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, to hearing more about your story. And I actually thought we could start um, with the Tokyo Paralympics because I'm so I also grew up in Saskatchewan. And I know I mentioned this to you um, when we were just chit chatting before. Um, but I know the hometown pride is so strong there. So so tell me about your experience uh, in Tokyo and, and what it's been like for you since then. Tokyo is absolutely incredible. And obviously it was a different game so with the pandemic. So we weren't actually in the Paralympic Village, which you kind of lose some of the benefit of a multi-sport games because we were in our own satellite village just because our venues were so far away. But, you know, it was still such an incredible experience. And as you mentioned, the support I had from back home was absolutely unparalleled. Um, growing up in a small town of 500 people, pretty much everybody knows me. And they put up banners down Main Street and they put up billboards on either side of town. And I had messages on every single social media platform available, just people who wanted to know when I was racing, wanted to congratulate me on my results. It, I think my heart grew four sizes every single day with just the amount of love I was getting from back home. Oh, wow. That's so beautiful uh, to hear that and, and to hear all of the support, especially as you said, you know, these games were obviously a, a bit of a different experience. So it's wonderful that you were able to feel that support and feel that love uh, from from the other side of the world that way. What was tell me about leading up to um, to your bronze medal? Um, what take me through kind of the, the earlier races and then and then that final as well? Yeah, so I raced on day one. So kind of I had my focus dialed in a little bit earlier than maybe some of the rest of the team just because they didn't race until the day or days after. So I kind of started to dial in my focus a little bit and I was feeling really good in training in the days leading up to. And then before my qualifying race, honestly, I did not feel very good. I think just the momentous situation kind of hit me and I, it got in my head and I'm not going to lie, I was very upset. I was very frustrated with my performance in my qualifying race. That was not the race I was in Tokyo to do. That was not, those were not the legs I had brought to Tokyo and that I had had in training in the days before. So I, I was really upset. I was really disappointed in myself, but I had, I had another race to do. And it was a race where I was not guaranteed a medal. So we knew we had to put the last race behind us and just move forward. So I remember getting off the track for my qualifying and I looked at my coach and I said, what happened to my legs? These aren't the legs I brought to Tokyo. But we were able to put that behind us, um, take another second off my pursuit time in the bronze medal match, which was good enough to bring home a bronze medal for Canada. So it was, it was really great to see what started with a bit of a disappointment in the day end up with a, a great, good performance. I'm quite happy with my performance in that bronze medal race and to see it come to fruition and see all of the work that the whole team had done in the past four years end up with Canada on the podium. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you you talked a little bit there about about some of the pressure. And I imagine um, since you were the first Canadian to bring home a medal in these games, there must have been a little bit of added pressure in that sense, too, that, that people were really watching to see if, if this was going to happen for you. Yeah, you know, I don't know that I, I didn't feel pressure externally, not from my coach, not from the staff, not even from those around, but I put a lot of pressure on myself. And even leading into the games, when I was watching the able-bodied Olympics, I would hear somebody say, this person could win Canada's first medal, or this person did win Canada's first medal. 
And it actually brought on a lot of anxiety for me. And I had to stop watching knowing that I could win Canada's first medal because I raced on the first day. So um, again, I did have a lot of that self-imposed pressure. And I think that was part of what made it really hard for me to perform in my qualifying race. But to see that actually play out and to have Canada's first medal be myself as a paracyclist, it was pretty, pretty incredible. And I think it was especially neat that a female cyclist won Canada's last medal in Tokyo, and then a female cyclist won their first Paralympic medal in Tokyo. So just kind of keeping that momentum going. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that is really cool. I mean, both both female athletes and then also uh, both cyclists. That's that is really cool. Um, you talked a bit about, um, you know, the having that disappointing first race in the qualifying round. How did you refocus uh, after that heading into the final? Between pursuits, we've only got, usually got anywhere from two to four hours to recover from what is really an excruciating effort. So I, I knew what I had to do in order to recover physically. So then I just used my mental energy and put it all towards that. So instead of looking back, I was focusing on what can I do in these next five minutes to really optimize my physical recovery. And in looking forward instead of back, I think that also helped with my mental recovery. So instead of trying to replay the race in my mind, I was focused on what do I need to eat and when do I need to eat it to be ready? When do I need to use compression on my legs to help them recover? When do I need to go for a walk? And just really trying to think of the five, 10 minutes ahead of me and not the hour, two hours behind me. Well, it's certainly worked out very well for you. Um, I, you know, you've made, I know your, your province, your city, your town, and, and of course the country proud. So, so congratulations. And, and thank you for sharing all of that, that with us as, as someone who, um, has never been to an Olympics, you know, I think it's always so exciting to hear about this experience from, from an athlete's perspective. Yeah, it, again, it was incredible. And it's unfortunate that it was a little bit of a different games and we didn't get that true multi-sport environment that you would normally get in the Paralympic Village. But I mean, I wouldn't change it for the world. I'm just, I'm grateful that the games were able to go ahead. There was a lot of uncertainty whether or not they would or they should. So I'm just grateful that we were able to have that opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of uncertainty, um, I know I mentioned um, your accident in the introduction that was a huge turning point um, in your life. It happened in 2009. I believe you were 15 at the time. So tell us what happened. So, yeah, it was November 9th. It's, I'll never forget the day. And it was actually, it was a Monday. I had the day off school in lieu of Remembrance Day. And it was a super mild day. Southern Saskatchewan, November can be iffy. Sometimes it's really, really, really cold. Some, but on this day, it was quite mild. It was really nice. So I decided to go out and check the elk for water. My parents raise elk on their farm. And November's kind of that time of year where there's not usually any water laying in the low spots anymore, but there's usually not snow that they can eat to get their water. So we just have to make sure that we haul them water and they always have water available. So I was out, I was gonna take my horse out to check the elk for water. And because it was such a gorgeous day, I decided to go just slightly longer than I normally would. And this was still going to be a relatively short ride. So I went without a saddle like I typically do for those short little rides to check the elk. I rarely put on a saddle on my horse. And taking that slightly longer route, I guess my horse just wasn't into it. He kind of, he missed his other horse friend. We strayed from the path that we would normally take and he decided he wanted to go home. So he just kind of took off, if we're being honest. He didn't buck, he didn't kick, he just went home and he got home as fast as he could. And because I didn't have a saddle on and I was wearing kind of silky track pants type thing that didn't have any grip, I just kind of rolled off the side of him. So it was almost a freak accident the way it all turned out. I don't, my horse isn't that big, so I didn't fall from that high. But I remember waking up, my cell phone was ringing. My dad was calling me because my horse was home, but I was not. And when I answered that call, I, I kind of felt like I was in a dream, like it's an experience I'd never had before and I haven't had since. And I told my dad that. And he knew right away, okay, you've had a concussion, stay where you are, don't try to get up, we're going to come get you. So mom and dad drove out to the field and they called one of their good friends who also happens to be a first responder. And this guy said, well, let's take her to the hospital and let's just check, check her out, make sure she gets the medical attention she requires, she's probably fine, but let's just check her out. So we went into the nearest hospital 
which was an Esteban. And they did all their tests, they did their x-rays and confirmation, I was diagnosed with concussion. So like any concussion, they send you home with a list of symptoms, things to watch for, and they give you a general guidance on what you should be doing, at least in the immediate future. So we went home and I remember getting up from the table that night after supper and the world kind of started spinning and I got really dizzy, really disoriented. So this is one of those symptoms they say to watch for. Mom called the hospital and they said, nope, she's fine, just watch her. So we go on with our lives and then later that evening I started slurring my speech. So once again, this is one of those symptoms they called the hospital and they were again told, nope, she's fine, just watch her. So. Mom had a really bad feeling that night, call it mother's intuition, if you will. So she slept with me. And I actually don't remember anything after getting out from the table and the world spinning. But I was told that I woke my mom up in the middle of the night because I had to go to the bathroom, but I couldn't move. So obviously, I'm not fine at this point. Um, They called the ambulance. The ambulance came out to the farm, told mom and dad where to meet them. Don't try to keep up and meet us at Regina General. So I was rushed to Regina General. And they did a CT scan, found a bleed deep within my brain. But they really, really wanted to avoid going into clot it manually if they didn't have to. The bleed was so deep that they they didn't want to take that risk. And luckily enough, that bleed stopped on its own and clotted on its own. But because my brain really needed to heal, there was still some pressure buildup and the after effects of that. They put me in a coma so that my brain could heal. And when I woke up from that coma, I had a tube down my throat breathing for me, a tube up my nose feeding me, my hands were tied to the bed, so I didn't pull out said tubes, and I couldn't feel or move half of my body. It was honestly almost like somebody had drawn a line right down the center of my entire body. On one side of that, everything was fine, and on the other side of that, I I couldn't feel it, I couldn't move it. When I smiled, only half my face would go up, I was on a liquid diet because half my throat didn't work couldn't roll over in bed. I couldn't feel it if somebody tickled my feet. Wow. This, I mean, you were, the way you're recounting, I'm sure you've told this story several times, but it, it's, I feel like I'm kind of being taken back there with you and and for your family. It it just must've all been so harrowing and, and really traumatizing for you to wake up in that position, not having really remembered how you got there. You know, and it's kind of funny because I had a, a little bit of memory. I The first thing actually I remember saying after waking up was, Dad, this is all just a dream, right? Like, I didn't fall off the horse. I'm not in the hospital. This is just a dream. And my dad kind of saying, no, Dolly, I, I'm sorry. You're, you're in Regina. You had a really bad accident. You are not well. I also remember I was coming off, the mor- off of morphine when I woke up. So I was really, really itchy. But because my hands were tied to the bed, I couldn't itch. And because I had a tube down my throat, I couldn't tell anybody where I was itchy. That's honestly what I remember most of waking up. <laughs> it's funny what, what kind of sticks with you after something like that. Yeah. And like, I always, you know, people will say, oh my goodness, that must've been so hard for you. And I always say, it was easy for me. I was in a coma. I don't know any of this. It was my parents and my family who it would have been absolutely devastating. At that same time, my oldest brother was in Afghanistan with the military and when I was put in the coma and mom and dad kind of asked, what are we looking at? Like, do her brothers need to come say goodbye? We need time. Aaron needs to come home if he needs to. And the doctors kind of said, we don't know. You need to do what you feel is best for your family. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. I can't imagine what they must have been going through in, in those moments. So, so obviously for them, it was a really a relief when you did wake up and, um, and they were able to see that at least at that point you were able to move some parts of your of your body. Yeah, I think just me waking up first and foremost was the biggest relief, Kate, she's okay. And then I start talking and it's, she's still there. And then it was slowly kind of as I came out from my coma and started to gain more and more consciousness that it was really a, she's still Keely. They're, they're really, I was very fortunate in that there were no real cognitive deficits that I sustained. And then after that, it was, you know what, even if we have to go through life with zero function on the left side of the body, I'm alive, I'm here, and I'm still me. And then luckily through many, many therapy sessions, I was able to regain a lot of function in the left side of my body. But I mean, I think to my family, just me waking up and, 
being there, being interactive was the biggest win. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and yeah, like you said too, um, it could have, you know, depending on what had happened, it could have significantly changed your personality and, and who you were. So I'm sure that that was such a relief to them to, to see that, that you were, that you were still you. When uh, you mentioned kind of recovering some of this function, um, on the left side of your body, when did that start to happen? And, and what was the kind of the recovery and, and rehabilitation process like for you? So I spent somewhere between three days and a week in that coma. I don't actually know how long because every time I ask, I get a different question. Mom says it's a part of her memory that she refer prefers not to go back to. And then I spent 10 days in Regina General. And even then in those early stages, I was slowly starting to get some recovery. And it would be it was things you couldn't necessarily see. But instead of being on a straight liquid diet, I could have nectar thick foods. So it was these small little things. And then once I was stable enough, I was transferred to Wascana Rehab. And honestly, I remember the first little bit of Wascana, I just slept a lot. I remember sleeping 16 to 18 hours a day. And I would go to therapy. And at that point, it was really just range of motion things, trying to almost remind my brain that these parts of my body were there. And slowly, I started getting reflexes back. So they would tap my knee and it would actually move. Slowly, when you tickled my feet, my toes would wiggle just the smallest amount. Slowly, I started to be able to feel things, and then I started being able to move things in very small ranges of motion. And then just with every passing day, we started to see more and more improvements. And then suddenly, I can walk with assistance. I can walk if I'm holding on to something, and now I can walk on my own. Wow. Each little piece of progress must have just felt like a small miracle. You know, I think to the outsider looking in, it did. But to me, as a 15-year-old girl, it was just devastatingly slow. It was like watching a puppy grow. Where, yes, as you know, you go, my dad goes by and he tickles my feet and there's a small motion. That's a huge win to him. But to me, I'm thinking, what does it matter if I can't go out and hang out with my friends? What does it matter if I can't go play volleyball like I want to? And then even as I was able to walk, it was always wanting more and always wanting just to get back to the person I was and never really happy because I never really had full function. I'm glad you reminded us there that you were 15 when this happened. I mean, you were so young. I think um, I also know that being a teenage girl is hard enough, uh, I think, as it is. Um, so I can't imagine what you must have been going through um, as you recovered from this and and you're also very young uh, at 15 years old. You at this time were, were also playing hockey at a very high level. So how did that factor into to how you were feeling during this recovery period? Yeah, like you said, hockey was kind of, it was my first true love, if we're being honest. I played a ton of other sports. I played volleyball. I played badminton. I raced motocross. I played soccer. But hockey was where my heart and soul was. And hockey was the sport that I wanted to play at the university level, I wanted to play at the Olympic level. The first time I walked, it was with a nurse supporting me by this really fancy little belt thing. It was probably a cumulative of five meters. And when I got back to the bed, I looked at the nurse and said, when can I skate? So it was really almost my primary motivator for getting better was I just wanted to play hockey again. But then when I did go to play hockey, I, I couldn't do it to the same level. The puck moves too fast now. My brain can't track it in the same way. Um, I can't do a full stride length on my left leg. I can't hold on to my stick very well with my left hand. And that was really tough because so much of my identity was wrapped up in being a hockey player. And now suddenly it's like this dream is just ripped out from under me. And I didn't know how to handle that. It was honestly an identity crisis at 15 years old because I, I couldn't be this player. I remember going to tryouts for the team that I had made the year previous just before I got hurt and not making the team and just thinking to myself, what now? Like I, I should have been able to make this team if not the one up. What now? Where do we go from here? That must have been incredibly 
hard and, and frustrating, I, I'm sure for you as well, um, as I'm sure you could still kind of picture yourself playing um, at, at the level you were playing at before. So how did you how did you get through that that time? That was a really, really challenging point in my life. And to this day, it was probably the most challenging point in my life. Um, yeah, I, I would say I did not get through it well. I remember just doing everything within my power to get back to be that hockey player that I once was. I spent hours and hours in the shop shooting pucks. I went to every skating camp I could. I went to every hockey camp I could. I, I researched drills I could do on my own. I did it all. And then I kind of remember one day looking back and I remembered a time when I was at a provincial tryout. And at this tryout, they had a list of all the girls who were there, their hometown, who they played for, their birthday, their height, and their weight. And at this point, I would have been, I think I was 13 when I went to that camp. And me and one other girl were sitting at like around 130 pounds or something on this list. And the rest of the girls were closer to 115. And so I remember thinking, oh, I just, if I just lose a little bit of weight, that, that's what I need to be a high caliber hockey player again. When in reality, I had just already hit my growth spurt and a lot of those girls hadn't. But I thought, okay, this is what I need to do. So I started watching my diet. I started exercising a little bit more. And soon I dropped five pounds. And then I still wasn't there to the hockey player I wanted to be, so I dropped another five. And suddenly everybody started telling me how great I looked, how fantastic I looked. So as a, at this point, 16-year-old girl, you're like, oh, this is what I need to do. And the more I lose, the more compliments I get. And next thing you know, I was down 40 pounds. I was 87 pounds when I was admitted to the psychiatric ward for anorexia. I was admitted to that ward almost a year to the day of being released from Wascana Rehab. In a competitive labor market, postgraduate studies can really help to set you apart. And Fanshawe College offers more than 50 programs to do just that in under one year. There are full-time and part-time options available, and many of the programs are even offered online. You'll leave with specialized skills from their career-focused curriculum, and many programs even offer credit toward industry designations. You don't have to wait until September either. There are January start dates for some of these postgraduate programs. To find out more, visit fanshawc.ca slash postgrad. Again, that's fanshawc.ca slash postgrad. You can also click on the link in the show notes. Wow, so on top of this very difficult recovery after the accident, um, you're now hospitalized for for anorexia. And this must have been, um, I mean, it kind of sounds like a lot of different factors sort of, of culminating in, in, in this experience. So what did you experience when you were in the, in the rehab facility? It, it sounds like this may have been another turning point for you. Yeah. Like you said, I think there was a lot of factors. I definitely had some unhealthy eating behaviors before I got hurt, but they were, they were manageable. We were able to handle it. But then I think once I got hurt and I felt like I had, I didn't have control over my body, let alone anything else in my life. And this was one thing that I could. And it all just kind of snowballed into the point where my body was shutting down. When I was admitted to the hospital, my heart rate was 37 beats per minute. For context right now, as an elite endurance athlete, I can't get my resting heart rate when I'm sleeping below 49. So to be awake moving at a heart rate of 37, my heart was quite literally shutting down. And then when I went to um, the psychiatric hospital, actually, I really struggled there. And I think because my team was more focused on the weight than they were about why I was struggling so much. So if anybody who knows anything about anorexia specifically, oh, the weight is only the symptom. The weight is not the problem. It's a symptom of the problem. However, my, my medical team didn't look any further than that superficial weight. So once I kind of realized that all I had to do to be released was put on a little bit of weight, I learned how to play the system and I put on the minimum amount they needed. But that means I, I never actually learned why it was such a struggle and why merely eating caused me so much anxiety. 
So even after I was released, anytime things got really stressful or I felt like the world was spiraling out of control, I went back to what I knew. I went back to binging. I went back to purging. I went back to over-exercising. And that led me to my first year of university where I was, again, back down to 80 pounds when I came home. And I was given kind of ultimatum after ultimatum by my, my friends, my family, my circle around me. And the quote unquote agreement was kind of that I had to be at least trending upwards in weight. Otherwise, mom and dad wouldn't pay for university. And to me, university was a big part of what I wanted my life to look like now that I, sport wasn't an option in my mind. So I needed to get a good job. I just needed to move on with my life. So I kind of toyed that line between being hospitalized and not being sick enough. So still you still purging quite often, still over exercising, still pushing myself to be always better. It was always, I need to be, I need to be getting better grades. I need to be lifting more weight. I need to just be better in general. And that, that went on for probably six or seven years of just self-hatred fueled day by day, just trying to get through the day each and every day. So while all my friends at university were going out partying, I was literally just trying to get through the day, just trying to keep my head above the water. And it wasn't until 20, this would have been 2015, the winter of 2015, I believe, when a fellow student approached me in the gym at university. And she kind of said, you know, I've heard your story. I've heard about your accident. I've seen how you move. I think you'd be classifiable for parasport. And she goes on to tell me about all these great things that can happen. You know, you can get coaching. They'll get help you out with equipment. You get to travel the world. They'll help you pay for university. She's like, just if you're interested, come with me to see my guy. So I went with her to see her sports scientist. And he kind of took a look at me and said, yep, you're definitely classifiable. Just pick a sport. And at this point, I've been commuting back and forth to the university on bike. And if I'm being honest, I think at that point... I liked doing that because it was just another way to build exercise into my daily routine. It was another way to expend more energy. But I figured I've got this bike. I've got kind of the baseline things I need to start training. And cycling's an individual sport, so hopefully I don't need to move anywhere to take part in it. So let's try that. So the summer of 2016, I kind of trained on my bike a little bit. And when I finished my undergrad degree, I bought myself an actual good road bike, and I continued to train. And then I entered my first race in May of 2017, and I, I don't even know how to describe it. It was like a switch flipped in, inside of me. I, I finally felt like myself. That athlete part of me that I had identified with for as long as I could remember was there well and alive again. I, I loved the competitiveness of the environment. I loved the brute physicality of the sport. I loved how it felt to push myself further than I thought I could have pushed myself. And with that, I kind of realized I can't let this go. This is something I need to keep going with. So shortly after getting home from that race, I went on the Canadian Paralympic Committee's website and I looked for every single email I could on that webpage and I emailed them all, pretty much saying, I have a brain injury and I'd like to bike. Where do we go from here? They put me in touch with the development coach at Cycling Canada, who we had never even talked on the phone, and he invited me out to a training camp in Quebec. So I packed up my bike, or rather I got the bike shop to do so because I didn't know how to pack my bike, and I flew across the country to go to this training camp with these people I'd never even spoken to on the phone. And from there, they were kind of like, you want to go to nationals? And I was like, I mean, that's, that sounds pretty cool. So I went to nationals and then they were like, Keely, you need to be officially classified. Let's go to world championships. So I entered my first race in May of 2017. And by March of 2018, I was at world championships. And at my first world championships, I finished fifth in the world in the pursuit. And I don't think I stopped smiling for four hours after that. I was just beaming. And I honestly don't know a time before that, that I had felt so blissful, so happy. Again, it was that, athlete identity part of myself that was so alive and well that I finally felt like myself. I finally felt like the person I could be, I used to be, and I truly could grow into being. After all of everything that you went through and, 
you know, this person approaches you in the gym and it sounds like it was kind of a casual, like, okay, yeah, you know, I'll give this a try. It sounds great. But to go from that to competing at the world championships and then coming fifth in such a short amount of time, I mean, maybe it didn't feel short at the time, but as you look back now, do you like, do you feel like that, that change happened very quickly? It was so quick and it's, it's hard to imagine now my life without cycling. I feel like I've been riding and racing bikes forever, but in all reality, it's been four and a half years since I got on the start line for my very first race. So to think of it that way, it's kind of like, wow, like the race I did won my pursuit in, I think I've probably done that race four times. That might've been like my sixth pursuit ever. And it was a bronze medal. So when I really kind of take a step back and I look at it in the context of everything else, it is kind of like a, wow, like, look how far we've come from that 15 year old girl laying in the hospital with a tube down her throat, that 16 year old girl in the psychiatric hospital whose body was shutting down to standing on the podium at the Paralympic games was Again, when you think of it in context of everything else, it's it's pretty incredible, really. Yeah, it, it's such a remarkable story. Um, I know you um, had, you know, we were talking about your um, about ending up in the hospital as you were battling anorexia and how this sort of continued um, over the the next five or six years. Um, was there a point for you? I know you had mentioned like initially the team was really treating kind of the physical symptoms and the eating portion of it. As you um, started cycling, was there a point in there where um, you were able to be treated for um, the more psychological side of, of that? You know, I think because I had such a negative experience that first time, I wasn't open to any professional help. Um, and that made it really challenging. But I think once I had cycling and I realized how how great this made me feel and how I finally felt like myself, I kind of realized that I can't get better at this. I can't compete on the world stage if I'm not fueling my body. My degrees are in exercise physiology, sport nutrition. So I, I knew the, base, the basic um, intellectual side of things. I knew what, in theory, what had to be done. And those were really what that knowledge and that love of cycling and that love of sport was really what helped me to, I would say, get over the hump with my eating disorder because it was, you know what, I really don't want to eat right now, but I've got intervals tomorrow morning. And if I don't have this snack, I'm not going to have the energy to do that. If I don't bring food on this ride, I'm not going to be able to hit my power output for the whole three hours. If I'm not getting enough carbs, enough proteins, enough fats, I'm not going to get stronger from this weightlifting. So I would say in the beginning, it was really cycling and my drive to get better and to exceed and to hit the highest level that helped me to get over the hump and at least get into a mental space where I could then process everything that I had been through in the last 10 years. And once I was in the mental state that allowed that and I allowed myself to think back to some of those times, that's when I was really able to work through some of the struggles that I did have. It sounds like cycling has been, um, healing and 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 kind of life-saving in in so many different ways yeah absolutely i i I don't hesitate at all to say that i think cycling saved my life because while kind of things were semi-managed before i started cycling it was going to take one bad thing one straw breaking the camel's back that was going to put me back into relapse and and how many times can you be 70 to 80 pounds before your body says that's enough? So I, I don't hesitate to say cycling came in and I found I found who I wanted to be and who I always wanted to be again, which then kind of gave me the strength to move on. And don't get me wrong, I'm, I still have days where I struggle. There, there's no doubt about that. And I probably will for most of my life. But it's knowing how to handle those voices, whether they're a whisper or whether they're the only thing I can hear. And it's having strategies and people around me who I can talk to and who I can brainstorm with or who can just listen. And knowing what my body needs and being able to kind of logic my way through it a little bit when I'm in the mind headspace to do so, 
and just getting through the hard days so that I can excel in the easy days. Yeah, I, I thank you so much for sharing that. I think like it's it's just so insightful to hear that. And um, I really appreciate that that you mentioned that, you know, it, it's kind of an ongoing um, it, it, it is ongoing and that the recovery is, is ongoing. It's not, it's not easy. Um, because I, I think that I'm sure a lot of people listening and watching, um, will, will find a lot of comfort and, and strength in, in you just sharing that so honestly. So, um, I thank you so much for that. Um, I, I wanted to ask a, a little bit about kind of what's next for you because you're coming off of this high of, of winning this bronze medal in Tokyo. Do you see another Olympics in, in your future? Absolutely. The goal has always been to stay on at least until Paris in 2024. So right now I'm trying to relax a little bit, let myself recover, live the life of a quote unquote normal person for a few weeks before I get back into structured training in October, likely in October. And then, yeah, my next world championships is in March. So once it, there's not a lot of downtime before we need to be back on peak form again, and then it will be continuing to push to train, to try to get better so that we can upgrade the color of that medal when Paris comes around. Amazing. I know you say you're, you're taking some downtime, but you are still very busy. You're also working uh, on your PhD right now. So how can you give me a little example of like what a typical day would look like for you when you are training and, and doing, and doing school? You know, I started racing my bike like three weeks after I started my master's degree. So I've never experienced grad school without having to balance training. But every day looks a little bit different, and I really find it's just a matter of managing my energy, especially with a brain injury. There's only so much my mental strain my brain can handle before it quite literally shuts down. So it's managing, and rather than balancing, it's finding a purposeful imbalance. So when schoolwork is really high, I try to taper back my training a little bit. And when I know training needs to be on point, I try to taper back my schoolwork a little bit. And it's also just knowing what is the most important thing in that day. If I've got a really, really important workout, it's going to get done first thing before I even open my laptop. If I've got important edits on a paper and there's a deadline coming up, school's going to happen first and training will happen later. So again, rather than finding balance, it's really about finding that purposeful imbalance. And I'm just really fortunate that I've got um, really supportive people on both sides of those, both on the academic and on the sport side, where they understand that I have these multiple different hats, if you will, that I wear and that it is a bit of a give and take. There's been times when I'm running into the facility to train, but I'm also FaceTiming into a course so I can give a presentation or that I'm in an airport in Brazil and I've got a layover. So I zoom into class and just trying to make it work as much as I can and not being afraid to ask for help when I need it. Wow. Yeah. It's, I'm, I'm also hearing that you are very organized <laughs> in this response. I, I'm a pretty typical type A person. So as I stand me right now, I've got a to-do list over here on the wall and I've got like a sub to-do list on a piece of paper over here. And I've got the hierarchy of what needs to be done on any given day to make sure I can get those done. So yeah, I think that little bit of type A helps me to manage these things a little bit. But I also think in having both of these aspects of my life help me in the other one, because it can be really challenging when your entire identity is wrapped up in a single thing. So by having research, when the games were postponed, I was able to switch my focus. And instead of being really down and feeling really lost because I didn't know if the Paralympics were going to go ahead, I was able to shift my focus and do a little bit more work school related. And when schoolwork is a little bit lighter and maybe I've got less going on, instead of sitting there and wallowing, I can then focus on cycling. And when I've been at the computer for four hours and my brain is mush, I can go out for an hour, hour and a half and come back with a new vitality, which I think improves my writing and my schoolwork. So there really is a really nice balance, I think, between the two aspects. Yeah, no kidding. And you are, you're doing your PhD in um, kinesiology at the University of Saskatchewan, right? Yeah, my area is sport nutrition and exercise physiology. And I specifically focus on female athletes, Paralympic athletes, and master's level athletes. 
Amazing. So your research is really focused uh, around around Paralympians as well. Yeah, and I think that's really neat. It's been such an, such an important, almost healing thing for me to be able to understand my body, being able to understand how my physiology has changed and what my body might need. So knowing that there are differences between myself and, let's say, one of the cyclists who is able-bodied, well, now there's going to be other differences for people with other sort of physical impairments. So I'm really interested in how we can help these athletes to reach their peak potential because there's mountains and mountains of research on able-bodied athletes, but the amount of research on um, Paralympic athletes or athletes with disabilities is very minimal. So I think if we can try to bridge the gap between the two of those, we're going to start to see even higher levels of performance at the Paralympic Games. And that's really going to help to change, I think, the public perception of what physical disability is. Well, absolutely. I mean, that is, that's amazing. I love hearing about this, this research. It does, it sounds like it can really, it's, it's going to, you know, the results of this will actually make a a huge difference in, in people's lives going forward. You mentioned there, like the the differences um, in um, in in different athletes who are competing at the Paralympics. Obviously, the differences um, in levels and ability. Can you can you give us some insight into um, how some of that classification would work? For example, like for for your for your sport, and I believe your uh, C four is your classification in cycling, right? Yeah, that's right. So in parasport, there is obviously a wide range of people with a wide range of different physical impairments. And some sports are specific to certain impairments. So something like wheelchair rugby is specific to those with quadriplegia. Something like goalball or five-a-side soccer are specific to those with visual impairments. But a lot of the sports, especially cycling, you see a whole host of different impairments. I think cycling is a really good example because there's a classification for almost every single physical impairment around. So in cycling, you get classified first based on the type of bike you ride. So my class is the C class and that stands for cycle. So you ride a typical two wheeled bicycle. And then you've got the H class, which is for hand bikes. Typically you'll see mostly people with spinal cord injuries. Sometimes you'll see people with a double amputation at the hips. Um, And then you've got your T class, which is for tricycles. And these individuals are typically going to be those with quite severe balance troubles. So oftentimes that's something like MS that has quite progressed or brain injuries that have impacted your balance to some degree. And then you've got the B class, which is tandems. So that would be for visually impaired athletes. So that is actually a bike with two people on it, the visually impaired person in the back, and then you've, they've got a pilot who is an able-bodied person who can see in the front driving the bike. And then within each of those classifications, there's a number scheme. So in my class, the C class, it goes from C1 to C5. The lower numbers indicate a higher level of impairment. So C1s would be those who ride two-wheel bikes that have the least amount of function, whereas C5 would be those with the most amount of function. Okay. And this, so these classifications and, and this must also be part of your, um, of your research. So as you, as you are studying, as you are working towards your PhD, do you have a vision for, for what you might do down the line? Do you want to teach or are you more interested in research or, or is it, or is it a combination? I would really like to kind of follow the traditional professor route. So one that's focused in research, but then teach a couple classes as well. Um, As somebody who does have a brain injury, I'm really interested, especially in how some nutritional supplements that might help with brain fog. So again, as I mentioned, my brain can only handle so much mental strain and I get um, quite mentally fatigued quite easily. So there's a little bit of research in the sporting world about how you can limit cognitive fatigue in sports. And I'm interested whether those might help in even general population with a brain injury to see if we can help manage some of that mental stress and general cognitive fatigue that comes post-traumatically after a brain injury. Well, it's so fascinating to hear this. And I definitely am looking forward to continuing to follow you uh, going forward as, as you progress through this research. Um, you know, it's been 12 years since 
that accident that 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 changed your life that changed everything for you that turning point as you reflect now on on the last 12 years and and where you are now what would you say you're most proud of you know i think i'd say i'm most proud that i didn't give up there are so many times when it would have been perfectly reasonable if i had just kind of said i'm done i'm i'm just kind of going to I'm happy with where I'm at. I'm just going to go through the motions. I'm just going to live what in my mind would have been a mediocre life of just these are the cards that was dealt, whatever, just one day at a time, just get through without really feeling like I was meeting my potential and truly succeeding. Whereas I think that I've been able to push through some incredibly dark times and still continue to push myself to be the best that I can be instead of being comfortable with where I am at at any given time. Because again, I think it would it would have been easy to give up and just say, well, I guess this is where we're at. So we'll, we'll just be happy with the status quo instead of continuing to push and continuing to, see, to find exactly what my potential is and what is possible for me in my life. You have so much to be proud of, and I think you just summed it up there so perfectly. I thank you so much for sharing your story. I know we talked about some really personal pieces of your life today, and I just really appreciate you uh, being so open and, and willing to share all of that. And um, so thank you so much for being here. It was such a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much for having me. And really, when I was going through a lot of these different times in my life, I did feel really alone, really alienated, because I grew up in a town of 500 people. This, these were not things that people were used to seeing. They didn't know how to react. So again, I felt very isolated, very alone. So if by sharing my story, I can help people realize that they're not alone, it gets better, there is hope and there's places to go from here, then my job is done and my career would have been a success. I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you so much, Keely. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for watching and listening today. Uh, drop us a line in the comment section below. Let us know what you thought of the episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. You can also subscribe to Turning Point on YouTube. Follow us on your favorite podcast channel for all of our upcoming episodes. And hey, if you have a Turning Point or you know someone who does, please send us an email at turningpoint at priasam.com. We would love to hear from you. Until next time, take good care of yourselves and of each other.